Well, thank you, Ali and Eric and the worship team for leading us today um, into the presence of God. We're so glad that you have joined us. Um, if we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Sterling Moore. I'm the campus pastor at our Mill Creek campus as we continue to work through our study of these letters from Jesus in the, in the book of Revelation to seven churches. I don't know if you've experienced this at all, um, but occasionally when I am scrolling through social media or looking on Instagram or whatever, I'll come across somebody's feed that, that I might know pretty well. And when you look at the feed, you get a particular expression of their life. But if you know them well, and, and maybe you've got some insight into what's going on in their life, you might feel this disconnect between what you're seeing on social media and the Instagram feed and, and what you know to be true or real. Perhaps you be, feel that about yourself. Perhaps you feel like the sort of version of you that you put out there in the world is different than the reality that you experience. I have a, a number of friends who are photographers and I've heard stories and moments when they've seen the, the final product get put up on social media and it's this beautiful picture of a family and everyone's smiling and the sun is setting and everything's this idealistic, perfect family. And yet they were there in the moments just prior to that, right? When one of the parents is in the face of the kid saying, if you don't smile or if you can't sit still, if you don't give me this, right? And they're right on, on top of them, like frustrated and angry. And then they get the perfect picture and the goes up on social media and they're like, oh, these, this family has my heart or whatever it is. Like we all know that and we all do that to, to some degree. And the reality is our, our social media feed is a curated selection of the version of our lives that, that we want people to see. But is it, is it true? Is it, is it real? Is it an accurate reflection? And, and what would an Instagram feed look like that was that? Today we're going to study the words of Jesus to a church in a city in Asia Minor called Sardis. And as Jesus pulls back the curtain for this church to reveal the condition of, of their spiritual health, well, let's just say it's not good news. In fact, I'd, I'd be willing to guess that it didn't fit at all with the image that they had formed of themselves. It's not at all the, the assumptions that anyone would have gathered if, if we had seen their social media feed. Throughout this series, we've, we've talked about, we've identified this pattern that, that exists in these seven letters. They often begin, they always begin with this unique description of who Jesus is. And, and that unique description is actually a, an example, it's a provision of how Jesus cares for or he meets the specific needs of these individual churches. It's, it's a unique expression of why their hope is found in Jesus. And then it usually follows with this accommodation. This is what you're getting right. These are the things that Jesus looks at and he celebrates and he praises them for. But then there's a correction. He usually says, this, this I hold against you. There's an area within the life of the church that needs to be addressed and Jesus calls it out. And then it follows with a call to repentance and, and the hope of a promise that he leaves them with. So if you're the church in Sardis, you're the fifth of, of these seven letters that you're receiving. And these would have been read together corporately. The church of Sardis, imagine this, is gathered in the room. This letter would have been read in its entirety. And so they've already heard what Jesus said to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira. They're probably anticipating the reality that, that Jesus is going to tell them some things that maybe are hard to hear, some things that he wants to address and correct. But they're also probably hanging on the idea that this affirmation is going to come, that Jesus is going to tell them some things that are really good, really that he's really um, encouraging them with in the life of the church. And yet this letter to, to Sardis, it, it veers a bit from this pattern. Let's look at this together. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we do just um, ask that you meet us in your word today. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds to hear from the Holy Spirit. As we look at what you said to this church, 
and we consider the implications for our lives and for our church. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, this is what Jesus writes. He says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So Jesus here is actually repeating the same sort of description of himself that he uses for Ephesus. So there is some similarities between what Jesus wants to say to Sardis and what he's already said to the church in Ephesus. He goes on, he says, I know your deeds. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. And I'll never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Right? What's notably absent in Jesus' words to Sardis is the accommodation. In fact, the only thing that could kind of read as an accommodation here is the fact that they, they have a reputation of being alive. Of all the things that could be said about you, of all the things that you are expecting to hear, there isn't anything that would be much more difficult to receive than the description that you're dead, particularly when your perception of yourself is that you are very much alive. So I wanna unpack that together. And we have to begin by looking at this terminal diagnosis that, that Jesus gives the church in Sardis, a terminal diagnosis. How do we know as the church when something is dead? Or how do we know as people when something is dead? Several months ago, I took my car in to get an oil change. And when I was there, um, you know, they check all kinds of different things. And they let me know that the lifespan of the battery on my car was dwindling. At the time, I didn't want to spend the 150 bucks. It started up just fine. It, it seemed like it had life going on. So I thought they were probably being a little bit premature. And I thought maybe I could get a while longer out of it. Well, fast forward um, a few weeks. And in like a busy season when we've got kids running everywhere and all sorts of things, my wife goes out to start the car and it is dead. Me not meaning like cranking over like but dead, dead. Like I couldn't even put jumper cables on it and get it going level of dead. Now, if you would walk by my house, you'd see that car sitting in the driveway and your perception of that car would be like, that's a nice looking car. That seems like it would operate just fine. But it's not until you went to, to use it for its design purpose that you would understand that it was in fact dead. In fact, one of the clearest indications that something is dead is its inability to fulfill what it's been designed to do. The church in Sardis is, is no longer fulfilling its design purpose. They had the reputation of being alive. That, that word reputation, the Greek word, literally means their name. So their, their name is alive, but Jesus rather directly says, you are dead. Right? They're nominally alive. It's interesting to think about this because this isn't the first time that Jesus has delivered this diagnosis. If you go back to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is confronting leaders in, among the Jewish people. Leaders who, who had a responsibility, who had a, a purpose, and yet Jesus is calling them out for their inability to fulfill this. And it sounds very similar to what he, he says to the church in Sardis. This is in Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 25. Jesus says this, he says, "'Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, "'you hypocrites. "'You clean the outside of the cup and dish, "'but the inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. "'Blind Pharisees, 
First clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the laws and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as, as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You read that entire chapter. If you read all of Matthew chapter 23, Jesus just is delivering this scathing indictment. He's looking at, at the supposed leaders of the people of Israel, people that are supposed to be awaiting the arrival of the Messiah and preparing the people, readying them for when he comes. And yet not only are they missing it, they're leading them astray. They're not fulfilling their God-given purpose. It's an indicator, Jesus says, of of death. To the church in Sardis, Jesus writes, he says, I, I know your deeds. I know that you have the reputation of being alive. So there seems to be this disconnect between their outward appearance, again, perhaps kind of echoing what Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, and the inward reality. So I want to take just a couple of moments here for us to think about what are, what are indicators of of a dying church, and perhaps conversely, what, what are indicators of a church that is alive? So what does a dying church look like? I think a dying church is, is not caring. A dying church is a not caring church. A lack of compassion is a hallmark of a dying church. So when pain and, and brokenness and injustice are are recognized when we come to understand that and, and we don't respond with a, a when, when we fail to respond with care and compassion, if we are unmoved, if we remain in our sort of comfort in our current situation, it's a sign that the church is no longer serving its kingdom passion. In fact, if you, our kingdom purpose, if you look back in Matthew 23, again, Jesus levies this same Sort of example, this is, I don't have this on a slide, but it's just a few verses earlier in 23, verse 23. Listen to what he says to the Pharisees. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, Jesus confronts them on, on the point of their lack of care and compassion for those that they've actually been called to lead. It's interesting to note here that when Jesus writes to the church in Sardis, there's no mention of persecution. There's no call or need for their perseverance. And, and this is a bit speculative, but is it possible that in an environment that is relatively accommodating or, or relatively accepting of the church and their presence in the community, is it possible that this has actually served to render them so lethargic that they've lost their distinctiveness? Is it, is it possible that the relative ease and comfort that they find themselves is actually more dangerous to the church than when they find themselves in a place of oppression and persecution. Because if that's the case, we need to be on our guard. We think about this from, from the opposite perspective. What does it look like? What is it described as when the church is alive? What are signs or evidence of that? Again, I think that's revealed to us in, in the work of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit producing in the alive church? And that's called the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's forbearance, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Paul says against all these things, there, there is no law. So you have this image of the alive church, the work of the Holy Spirit in the midst of the church, and the juxtaposition of, of what a dying church looks like. Additionally, I think a dying church is, is not candid. They're not candid. Imagine that idea of, of going to the doctor for a checkup. And you come in healthy and strong and feeling good. And 
the doctor does blood work, and in the blood work, he finds something that, that is concerning. But he doesn't want to upset you. He doesn't, he doesn't want to throw off your day, and so he just keeps that information to himself. That, that would be malpractice. We would, we would look at that and say that should never be the case. But if we, if we take Scripture at its word, right, sin has a 0% survivability rate apart from Christ. Right, Paul's expression of it is the wages of sin is death. And, and don't get me wrong here. We, we can cite any number of examples throughout church history where people have delivered truth, but they've done so without compassion and care. And that's not what we're talking about. Jesus says that's not okay, but the solution is not to compromise on truth. This is the accusation, again, that Jesus brings against the Pharisees. If you look again back in, in Matthew chapter 23, and earlier in that same passage in verse 15, Jesus says this to the Pharisees. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you succeed, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. That, that's, that's intense. But they're proclaiming a message apart from Christ. They're, they're, the, the central thrust of their message is that if they can be as righteous as they are, if they can produce a much, as, uh, as much good works in their life as they as the Pharisees do, then God should find them acceptable. And Jesus confronts that. And he says, it's not true. And so conversely, again, a church that is live is committed to the truth that, that of who Jesus is, of, of our condition apart from him and inviting people to know him. Lastly, then, I think when we look at an indications of, of a dying church, we see that a dying church, um, that it's not costly. There's a conversation that's recorded in the Gospels. It's, we know the person simply as the rich young ruler. Comes to Jesus and he asks himself the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus engages in the conversation with him. I mean, he actually cites to him the law, the Ten Commandments. And what Jesus is doing in that moment is he's, he's helping deliver him to the understanding that there's nothing that he can do. Like the law demands more than what he's capable of. So he needs something outside of himself. But the man in, 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 in pride sort of responds to Jesus and says, I've done all these things since I was a child. And, and Jesus looks, the, the, the passage says in Mark chapter 10, says Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he says, well, then go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. In Matthew 10, verse 22, this is one of the, I think, the saddest verses in all of Scripture. It says, at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. If we can afford to follow Jesus, and again, I'm not talking exclusively financially. I'm talking about our lives as a whole. If we can afford to follow Jesus, then we've misunderstood the invitation of Jesus. The invitation of Jesus is to see our entire lives and everything that we have to be at his kingdom disposal. Right? Radical generosity, whether that's in our time or our energy or our giftedness or our homes or whatever we have at our disposal, Radical generosity of that sort is, a, is an indication of life in the church. So when we look at this holistically, in other words, when we see Jesus addressing the church in Sardis, he's saying here that, that the proclamation, the true expression of the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit are the clearest evidence that a church is alive, which then brings us to what, what Jesus prescribes. This is the prescription he gives the church here. I don't know if you've uh, paid attention to this, but over the last few years, Major League Baseball has um, expanded the netting that runs along the side of, of the seats. And they've done this because they were having more and more incidents where a foul ball would be hit and, and, and it was dangerous. People were being hit by these, these foul balls. Of course, baseball has existed with foul balls for a long time, but what changed was the presence of, of technology. 
So many fans were sitting in the seats and staring at their phones that, that they were no longer seeing what was going on around them. So they're in an environment where world-class athletes have sent projectiles out all around them, and yet they're oblivious to where they're at and to what's going on, and it's dangerous, right? In the midst of that situation, the remedy is to pay attention. Look again back in Revelation chapter 3. This is what Jesus says to the church in Sardis. This is his prescription to them. Verse 2, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Normally, when, when something has been declared to be dead, we don't, we don't think about there being the possibility of, of life. We don't think about something that could restore them to life. But Jesus is in the business of making dead things alive again. Paul words it this way in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. This is what he does. He breathes life into that which is dead. It seems clear here to, from Jesus' words to Sardis that his his understanding is that the work that God has placed them there to do is not yet done. He says, I have found your deeds to be unfinished. So Jesus lays out for them the, the, the cure, what they need. Notice the imperatives that take place in these, these couple verses here. First, it's that uh, exclamation to wake up. Jesus is, is, is most likely actually playing on the historical background of the city of Sardis. Sardis was considered to largely be a city that could not be conquered. And yet, historically, twice, this city was in fact conquered, not, not by an army coming in to overtake them, but rather by, by an a individual or a couple people making their way into the city at night when no one was on guard. See, the truth that, that Jesus says to the to the people in Sardis is, is pay attention. Look, look at what's happening. Don't kill yourself. Don't, don't, be, don't be ignorant of the threat that the church is facing. He says, wake up. And then he says, strengthen what remains. The Greek word here for strengthen carries a sense of urgency and purpose. It, it, it's this remnant idea within the church. And again, if we, if we go back into the Old Testament, we see God consistently finding a remnant of the faithful and, and spurring them on to the life he's called them to. And he does the same here. He says, find those who have not forgotten. Find those who have not compromised the gospel. Find that small ember and fan it into flames. Reignite the church. Identify where the signs of life are and then turn resolutely in that direction. Then he instructs us to remember. He says to remember what you've received and heard. Far too often, right? Familiarity breeds contempt or at the very least complacency. Central to the life of the church. Is, is this call of, uh, that Jesus has placed in our lives to, to preach the gospel to each other, to remember what it is that, that brought us into relationship with Christ in the first place, to never lose sight of the fact that we need Jesus and that we need to understand the mission that he's placed in front of us as his church, this kingdom mission. When, we, when you and I start to take that for granted, when we lose sight of that, if we start to forget the gospel, the actual transformative, life-giving, sin-forgiving, grace-applying truth of the gospel, when, when that takes a back seat in our lives, then we start to die as a part of the church. This expression of the body of Christ starts to die. 
And then Jesus says, as he says to all of these, he says to hold fast to that, and then he says, repent. Jesus has invited every church, with the exception of Smyrna, where he does not offer a correction, he's invited every single one of these, these churches into a place of repentance, to turn around, to return to, to what brought them to life in the first place. I think it's unfortunate that in our culture, the idea of repentance is, is negative or almost oppressive. That, that somebody would say you're doing something wrong, but that is not the biblical sense of the word repent. The biblical sense of the word for repent is it's, it's loving. It's, it's seeing somebody who is clearly heading in the direction of destruction and saying, turn around. Turn around to what gives you life. This is the invitation of Jesus. Turn around to the one who said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Which brings us then to this third part of, of this letter, and that's the promise of life. The promise of life, again, verses 4 through 6. Jesus says this. He says, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious, who, who repents, will, like them, be dressed in white. And I'll never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Right? In each of these letters, there is a correlation between the description of Jesus at the outset of the letter and the promise he offers at the conclusion. And once again, that is true to the church in Sardis. They need the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to breathe new life into them as the church. I want us to let this just sink in for a moment because it's so good. The references of being clothed in white and, and, and being known by name depict how Jesus will, will lay onto us his perfection and his sinlessness. And I love how, how personal this gets. This, this image of, of being in the presence of God and, and the angels, this, this scene of why God would allow us into his perfect and holy presence. And Jesus says, oh, that's, that's Sterling. I know him by name. And he places on me the perfection of his perfectly righteous life. We call that, and theologically, we talk about that as imputed righteousness, given to me as if it were mine. And Jesus says, I clothe them in white. I, I declare them to be innocent and pure, the result of what he has done, not what I have done. So this letter to Sardis, as harsh as this diagnosis is, this letter, make no mistake, it's a letter of hope and it's a promise of life. It's an invitation. It's the nature of Jesus, that, that perfect, holy nature of Jesus that makes us acceptable in front of a perfect and holy God. It welcomes us into his presence. That's the promise that Jesus delivers to the church in Sardis. And that's the promise that he delivers to us. And he says, don't lose sight of that church. Wake up, pay attention. Recommit yourselves to the truth of the gospel and the work I've put you here to do. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you again for this letter. We thank you for the heart of... of um, our God that is revealed for the people in Sardis. And we thank you that that same heart applies to us. Lord, we recognize, we confess that sometimes we can look very much alive. And yet there's things going on in the inside that are, that are not from you. That we can lose our compassion, that we can stop speaking truth, that, that we can kind of come in our own terms. Lord, we confess that to you today. Lord, we come in a place of repentance to return to the life that you have extended to us by your work on the cross. Continue to do this work in the church, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Thank you, church. Now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who has promised to lay on top of those who name the name of Jesus, his perfect righteousness to clothe us in white. And it's his name we pray. Amen.